I think we can start now. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you tonight. Father, forgive me for being late uh, to the party here tonight. Um, and we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, bless this assembly. Help us, Lord, to understand your word better. And more than that, Lord, help us to understand you better. And help us to understand ourselves better. Uh, we want to cast away uh, the things of darkness, and we want to put on this armor of light that is Jesus Christ. And so bless us in that attempt tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's have somebody, uh, we're going to be in Romans 13 tonight, and uh, I'd like you to, uh, if somebody would just read verse 14 for us. That is the key verse throughout the series. I put on the Lord Jesus Christ to make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Okay, so put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's That's been the theme. Um, I'll tell you, uh, we'll cover this a little bit more at the end, but tonight is the last regular class for this. When I say regular, next week is the exam. Oops. And you said, <laughs> what? Uh, I'm not in eighth grade anymore, but that's okay. Uh, we're we're going to have an exam, and it's going to be a, it's going to be an enjoyable exam. You're going to like it. Uh, <laughs> Must be food involved. You <laughs> no, there's no food involved. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and Sunday, I will bring the flyer for um, that'll that'll announce what the next topic is. But we'll uh, I'm going to hang on to that right now. Um, but we're going to stay in Romans 13, and we've covered a lot of Romans 13, but I want to go and cover beginning at verse 8. That's where we're going to start tonight, verse 8. And remember, since this is the last, um, the last lesson type meeting for this series, uh, we're, we're wanting to wrap it up, and we're wanting to come right back to that point, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to know what that's about. And, uh, and I think Romans 13, right where we started, is a great place to, to wrap it up and to uh, put a cap on it. So if we could have somebody read verse 8. Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the lo one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Okay, so, um, you know, there's in indicators in, in Scripture, and some say even stronger than indicators, that, uh, that we shouldn't owe anyone, anyone anything when it comes to cold hard cash. We shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be borrowers, and, uh, and I don't know that it goes that far, though. I'm, um, I think uh, it would be awful hard to own a house. It wouldn't be impossible, for sure, but it would be hard to own a house and some other things. So I'm not going to get into that part, but what I want to focus here is where Paul is going to focus. Um, he's saying there's a debt from which we will never be free. And that is the debt of love. We, we owe a debt of love uh, to one another. And we're going to see also that it's to our neighbor. Uh, Jesus himself said that, that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. And so Paul is about to, to explain to us that, um, that we have this debt that's never going to clear up. We, we will always have this debt. We will always owe love by his command to others. And, uh, and God's word tells us that. Uh, verse 9 says, For the commandments, uh, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not uh, murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, uh, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so let's, let me give you a, a taste. Let me give you a taste of what next week is going to be like. Um, you shall not commit adultery. And you stay quiet because I know you know these. What, <laughs> what commandment is that? Wow. Which number? <clears throat> yeah. You shall not commit adultery. Five. Wrong. Eight, six, six or seven. It's seven. Seven. Uh, you shall not murder. <laughs> six. Yes. Six. Uh, <laughs> you shall not steal. Five. 
Wrong. Eight. 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 <laughs> All right, so that's a taste of what next week is going to be. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, Jesus begins to, or, or Paul begins to, to recap what Jesus has said, what, what came to Moses on the tablets, uh, the commandments. He says uh, that it's summed up, that these things are summed up by you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm, verse 10 says, to a neighbor. Therefore, love is, is the fulfillment of the law. Now, we, we said commandment and we said law. What, what's the difference between the commandments and the law? You guys are going to do well on the test next mm -hmm. week. It's going to be great. <laughs> the commandments, the commandments are, from God. are the law. <laughs> the law is the commandments. The commandments are part of the overall law. But um, generally, when somebody <coughs> says the law, um, they certainly mean the commandments. It always means the commandments. And... Uh, and uh, and so, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Let's hang on to where you're at. Oh, hi, Don. Uh, we're, we're in uh, Romans 13, but right now we're turning to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse 35. And we touched on this earlier in the series, but we need to go back to it. Matthew 22 and verse 35. And when we get there, if someone would read verse 35 to 39. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so... Remember we had that discussion about the commandments and, and my theory that uh, the reason why there was two tablets. Do you remember that discussion that we had? That the first uh, four commandments have to do with our relationship with God. It's our vertical relationship with God. That there's no other God but Him. That we will not uh, create for ourselves idols and bow down to them and serve them and worship them. Uh, that we will not blaspheme the name of the Lord, and that, that uh, the, the Sabbath day would be kept holy. And then the last six commandments were the ones that Paul was mentioning uh, up above here, uh, or in, in uh, Romans 13, those are the ones that Paul was mentioning. That is our horizontal relationships, that's our relationships with each other. And, and so we've got both of those, so uh, this lawyer tries to trip Jesus up, and have him choose one commandment. And if he did that, um, he's going to be in trouble because the lawyer then, being a slick talker like they are, we have lawyers here tonight? Yeah. Being slick talkers like they are, uh, they, uh, you know, he's going to twist that and say, oh, so uh, you shall not murder. Well, what about adultery? You know, and, and try to come back at him and tie him up in his own words. And... Uh, but uh, Jesus says, I want to just break it down for you. Love the Lord your God with everything. All that you are, all that you have, love the Lord your God. And he gave him a twofer. Uh, and love your neighbor as yourself. I think it's interesting, and we're, we're not going um, we're not going to go into it, but um, Jesus says in the second is like it. Did you notice that? The second is like it. Like what? Well, you just said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Um, and the second one is like it. How is it like it? Uh, again, I'm not going to go into that. We, we touched on it a little bit last, the, the time when we, when we got on this. But uh, um, you might want to chew on that. That's a great meditation right there. How is it like it? Uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, there's a lot of people that if you ask them, and they may even volunteer it, oh yeah, I love everybody. Uh, and maybe, maybe you're like that. I have that feeling, if I was to say, you know, how's my love meter, I'd say, well, I love everybody. I love everyone. And, uh, but that's really, that's really talk. 
that's uh, as one of my bosses used to say, that's chin music. That's, that's just you saying it. It's not demonstrating it, but Jesus brought it down to real when he said, your neighbor. He says, that, you know, that guy that lives by you. You know, the, the, the families that live around you. Your neighbors. You need to love them like you love yourself. Like you love yourself. Um, and, and when we go back and look at what Paul said in Romans 13, you don't have to look there right now, but... Um, in fact, while I'm talking, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Uh, Paul says, you know, love doesn't, doesn't hurt a neighbor by adultery. Uh, you, you're not going to have an affair with your neighbor's husband or your neighbor's wife. Uh, you're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going um, to kill your neighbor. Uh, those kind of things. This is showing love to a neighbor. And uh, Jesus makes this personal, and he says, you know those people you live near? Uh, those are the folks you need to love. I think that's where we need to start, for sure, right? I think we need to have a heart that says, I love everybody. The, every person is a creation of God, and, uh, and I don't know the beginning from the end like the Lord knows the beginning from the end. So as far as I know, this person can be saved. This person... Their heart can turn toward the Lord. So I need to look at them as valuable in the eyes of the Lord. And, and so they need to be valuable in my eyes. And I need to love them. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Not of works. Lest anyone should boast. And boy we would. Wouldn't we? We would boast and brag that we... We were responsible for our own salvation, and uh, hello, Roger. Uh, and and so, it is not of works, lest any any of us would boast. That's not the part that I wanted to get to. Verses eight and nine are, are critical, and we need to understand it. But this is more of the elementary things. We need to know that we're saved by grace. It's a gift of God. It's a free gift. We didn't earn it. We can never earn it. But look at verse ten. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So our God, who does know the beginning from the end, he does know every heart. He knows uh, which ones of us are going to turn toward him and which ones aren't. Uh, and, and that's a whole other big discussion that we're not going to get into tonight uh, that, that has to do with uh, in places in the Bible that talk about predestined uh, souls. Uh, but God knows the beginning from the end. He knows a soul who's going to eventually turn to him. And, uh, and he knows that because he's God. And because he knows that, he has prepared beforehand works that we are to walk in. We are to complete in this life that we have in Christ. He also knows when we're going to be saved, and he knows from the time we're saved that that process of sanctification that we talked about, that walk of ever-increasing holiness toward the Lord, that we have so long. And so he's prepared things. He's put them in our paths. We can't miss them. And I don't know if you've ever thought that before, and you think, wow, you know, in the past three days, my life has taken a turn that I would have never guessed. Uh, the Lord knew. The Lord, the Lord knows your path, where you're headed. He has put things in your path. And, and if we do not quench the Spirit, we've talked about that. If we don't grieve the Spirit, quench the Spirit. If we are, are humble and obedient and submissive to the Spirit and the Word of God, we'll see those opportunities and we'll honor God by doing these good works. Uh, we, we, uh, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for Good works, and these good works bless and, and they honor God. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to say. And then in, in uh, Matthew, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, in Matthew 22, um, you don't have to turn back there. I, I left a verse off, verse 40. On these two commandments, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. Hang all the law and the prophets. Okay, now I'm going to get all preachery on you because uh, um, 
this is this is a great place for a preacher and for those of us who look at scripture and we say wow you know some things kind of fit together and i'm wondering if what the lord meant by this is this and this is a part that i didn't get to on the night that we covered um the commandments and we talked about the the vertical relationship with god and the horizontal relationship with men the first four commandments the second six commandments and, uh, and I just want you to think about this. Jesus Christ was placed on a cross. Uh, as much as Jehovah's Witnesses would like him on a stake, as, as much as um, other people would have him tied to a tree or, or whatever, Jesus was crucified on a cross. And the cross uh, has an upright and it has a crossbar. And, and Jesus was suspended, Scripture says, between heaven and earth. And, uh, and, and I want you to see that cross as, as a picture. The, the cross, I don't believe, holds any magical um, <clears throat> power. It is not something to be worshipped as much as, as people would worship it if it was around today. People would worship that uh, and, and, would, uh, and would serve it. But I, I want you to think about this. There was an upright... And there were four commandments that had to do with our relationship with our Father. And there was a crossbar. And the crossbar, uh, to me, speaks of that horizontal relationship with each other. And yet, because Jesus became sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him, He became the blasphemer. He became uh, the idolater. He became the one that broke the Sabbath. He became uh, the one who didn't love his neighbor, who, who, uh, who committed adultery. He's the one who uh, stole. He's the one who lied. He's the one who coveted. And, and so it was the commandments. We, we say, and I know I said it plenty of times in at least two of the lessons that we had, that the commandments cannot save you. You cannot be saved by keeping the commandments. Number one, nobody can. That's proven. Uh, number two, the Bible says that all have sinned. In other words, we all have already sinned and broken those commandments. Uh, and, and number three, if we could go to heaven because we kept the commandments, God did not have to put his son on the cross. And God was a fool to put his son on the cross and have him suffer like that. And God wouldn't do that. There's one way. And, uh, and his name is Jesus. And, uh, and so um, that's the picture I want you to see. Jesus was nailed to the thing that convicted him. The commandments. He, he was, uh, and again, this is, this is high level preacher talk right now. There, nowhere in Scripture does it say that, but just for thought purposes, when I see the cross, that's what I see today. I see that we have broken the law that, that, that is our relationship between God and, and us, and I've also broken that relationship between uh, myself and you all. Um, and because of that, Jesus had to die and had to take my place. He didn't have to. It's a gift. God says, I want you in my family. I love you. I love you with the love you can't understand. You don't owe me a thing for it except to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and receive the Holy Spirit, and then live for me. And, uh, and so that's the picture there that I see is Jesus <coughs> nailed to what he was convicted by, uh, the, the law. Let's look back in Romans chapter 13. And if somebody could read verse 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer <clears throat> to us now than when we first believed. All right. Um, do you believe that, that salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed? I hope you do because it's just math. It's just the calendar. That's all it is. If we believe that he, that uh, that uh, that our salvation 
is coming, if we believe that the Lord is returning, if we believe that all the promises are going to come true, uh, then of course we're, we're nearer. But think about this. We are 2,000 years more near than when this was written uh, in general. And, uh, and so do, do this, do these things that Paul said above, uh, knowing that the time uh, that now is high time. It, it's past time. It is time. It's awful warm in here, isn't it? Is that... I can lower the temperature. Yeah, look. I, I see everybody getting groggy, including me. Um, Is Wendy asleep yet? <laughs> Why don't you <laughs> She's driven a long way. <laughs> Listen, Paul says it is high time to do what? It's just two words away. To wake up. To wake up, to awake, out of sleep. For now, salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Uh, there are folks who are sound asleep as, a, as Christians. They, they have done the elementary things. They have done the entry things in the kingdom. Uh, they, they have believed. They have repented. They have been baptized. They have, uh, they have received the Holy Spirit. And they go into this uh, cocoon of of uh, inactivity and, and uh, being pretty much a, a pew potato. And, uh, and so Paul says it's high time that we wake up out of that. Some, some folks, I just want to, as, a, as a, a preacher, as a minister, just want to grab them by the shoulders and say, wake up, wake up. It, they talk <laughs> like they've got forever. And they don't have forever. They do not have forever. Uh, so why, why do I go into that depth on that point? It's because sometimes you and I, we've got loved ones we've got to have hard discussions with. Because it is, do you agree, it's life and death. It's life or death. It, it is time to get involved. It's time to wake them up, shake them awake, whatever it takes to wake them up. And that's not, a, that's not an easy discussion. Um, but let me ask you this, are you one who's asleep? Don't, don't raise your hand or anything, but if you are one who's asleep, who is taking this life for granted, who has uh, said, you know, I've got my ticket to heaven, and, and praise God, and, and uh, now I just wait until my pulse stops, and I assume room temperature, and then uh, I'm in heaven. And uh, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. Uh, the Lord said, go. He didn't say, uh, you know, now take a break. There's a reason why that when we're saved, we're not snapped up immediately. What, wouldn't that be the program, though? Yeah. You rise from the waters of baptism, you receive the Holy Spirit, and die in Jeff's arms. <laughs> <laughs> Have the funeral that afternoon, and chicken on the, on the church lawn. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That's not the way it happens. Why is that? That sounds like such a good plan. I can't mess up if I die immediately. Yeah? He tried that when he baptized me. He said he's going to hold me under the water for seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. you, you probably deserved it. Oh, I, I a lot of work. <laughs> Constantine actually was holding out for that. Oh, yeah? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. He didn't want to die before he, he didn't want to get baptized until close to his death. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. So, uh, so, senior moment. <laughs> so it's high time. If you are in that category, if you think that I've been saved and now I'm kind of in Christian retirement, you're not. You are alive and God is giving you the next breath and the next breath for a reason. I guarantee it. We've got stuff to do. And if you say, I'm all crippled up, and I can't do this, and I, Jim, I can't even, I don't have those kind of gifts, you can pray. What are you doing? Are you, are you in the prayer closet? Are you praying for people, for, for your preacher? Are you praying for the elders? Are you praying for the church around the world, for those who are in prison for the name of Jesus Christ? Are you praying for that, that uh, ornery neighbor of yours? What are you doing? We are not yet retired to move on to heaven. Wake up. That goes for me too. I need to wake up out of this. And so uh, uh, verse 12, somebody read verse 12, Romans 13, 12. 
The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on the armor of light. Um, I had a whole lesson that I was going to do of the armor of God. Uh, and then Jeff preached it. And I don't need to do that now. So that's good. That lets me do this. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Shine all over Logansport, I'm going to let it shine. Shine all over Logansport, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, all you stuffy people can sing too. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. The kids are going to think they're in the wrong class. Don't let Satan get out, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan get out, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Why do you think we teach the kids that? This little light of mine. This little light of mine. Um, there was a, a president that in his inauguration uh, speech in 1989, uh, George Bush Sr., uh, he said these words, I have spoken of a thousand points of light. You remember a thousand points of light? Mm -hmm. yep. All of the community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good we will work hand in hand, encouraging, sometimes leading, sometimes being led, rewarding. We will work on this in the White House, in the cabinet agencies. I will go to the people and the programs that are the brighter points of light, and I will ask every member of my government to become involved. The old ideas are new again because they're not <coughs> old. They're timeless. Duty, sacrifice, commitment. Patriotism that finds its expression in taking part and pitching in. You know that when we're donating coats, uh, we're doing something good, aren't we? We're doing something good. But you know, we're not just warming uh, those who wouldn't have a coat. We are shining our little light. We are, we are shining the light and the love of Jesus Christ. A thousand points of light. I, I love that. When, when I first heard him say that, I thought, and I'm not all that hip on George Bush Sr. I'm not, I'm not revealing to you my, my, uh, my uh, political views uh, too much, but um, I always love that saying, a thousand points of light. And, uh, but when we're donating coats, we're donating to reach out in love and in light to those who are in darkness. And, uh, but there's also uh, another comparison um, in that uh, the stars, uh, when we look out the window right now, I can't see them. But I can see them in the dark. And the darker it is, of course it's gotta be clear, um, the darker it is, the better I can see them. And in fact, people complain when they're in the city because the lights tend to get in the way of you seeing the stars. I love to see the stars. Uh, when I look up in the sky, I see the, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. I could not tell you any other organization of stars in the heavens. But when I was a Boy Scout, I remember the Scoutmaster saying, uh, Hey, Jimmy, uh, that right there, that's the Big Dipper. And see this one way over in the other part of the sky that looks kind of like that? That's a Little Dipper. And, and you know, those things are there today. When I walk my dog at night, those things are right there, and I can see them. And, and it, it speaks of God's, uh, God's power, speaks of His creativity, of His design, and, uh, and the fact that He doesn't change. And it also speaks to something like what we're talking about here, when Paul says, put on this armor of what? Light. Light. Put on the armor of light. First of all, did you notice in verse 12, he says, uh, after he says that, hey, it's, it's about time, folks, cast off the works of darkness. 
take off that garment of darkness. When we talk about darkness, um, this, is the, this is softball I'm just pitching out there. What are we talking about? If I'm, if I'm casting off darkness, what am I casting off? Sin. Sin. And, and, uh, and evilness and wickedness, we're casting off the things of the world, the fleshly lusts of the world. And we're doing that in favor of putting on this armor of light. This is, this is verse 14 here, this last part. It is, it is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and making no provision for the lust of the flesh that we might accomplish what it wants to do. Uh, put on this armor of light. And you may think that your little light doesn't make any difference, but it does. Your little light makes a difference. Have you ever thought about why, uh, why Marsha and I live in Kokomo and why some of you might live on Erie Avenue and others live on Broadway and some live on Smeet Street and so forth? Some of us live out, out of town just a little bit um, and, and, and that we don't all live together in one clump. I think that's God's plan too. I think when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, he doesn't want us all to have the same neighbor. He has given us as points of light out in our neighborhoods and out in our communities and out in our cities to be light in the darkness. And, and, uh, and there is darkness. There's darkness in, in uh, nearly every neighborhood, I'm guessing. Uh, there's darkness for us to be a bright light in. And, and so, um, I just, uh, again, this is, Jeff, I told him this is the last lesson part of this series. Next week is the exam. So, uh, and then we get into, uh, into a new series. But uh, does it, do you remember this song? If you remember this song, sing with me. And you'll find out. I sing every once in a while. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His lighthouse evermore. But to us He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. That's what that song's about. We, we've been given charge of the lights along the shore. These folks who are desperate, they don't know that they're looking for Christ, maybe. They know they're looking for something because their life is empty. Their life is void and vacant and hollow and echoing. And they don't know what they need. And they continue to try to put things in their life and draw things into their life to fill that void and to make them feel like a, a whole person. But they're not finding it. And they won't find it because what they lack is Christ Jesus. Jesus. They lack Jesus. And uh, and again, uh, you know, I've heard it preached that that we all have a, a Christ-shaped or a God-shaped hole in our hearts, and, and only God will fill that shape uh, just right, and maybe that's good preaching. I'm just saying that a life without Jesus Christ is not the life that you were born to be. We were all, every person, even that ornery neighbor of yours, was born to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. When they are not connected in that way, they are not the person that, that they're to be. And they know it. And it feels incomplete. And the incompleteness will grab a hold of many and it becomes the end of their life. Because they cannot find anything to fill that. Drugs don't fill it. Um, adultery and per promiscuous behavior doesn't fill it. Pornography and drunkenness doesn't fill it. Uh, money doesn't fill it. Great uh, homes and cars don't fill it. And when they have tried to fill it with everything that they can think of, and they run out of ideas, and Christ hasn't crossed their mind, or they've turned him away, many say, I, I just can't handle the emptiness anymore. And maybe they don't say it in so many words, but that's what's missing. It's Christ. And so we have a... We have a a huge job as lights to draw, to draw folks to Jesus Christ. 
They should see Jesus. I mentioned this in, in a, a lesson uh, a couple of weeks ago. They should see and hear and experience at least a glimpse of Jesus in us. They need to, they need to know that we've been with Jesus. Verse 13. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. When we become Christians, I'm wondering if some don't think that when they are, when they repent and are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, I wonder if some don't think that Christ is going to live that Christian life through them. But Christ isn't going to live it for them, is he? He's not going to do that. We don't become robots. We don't become uh, little goody two-shoes holy robots. Jesus isn't going to live our Christian life for us. But Jesus is going to make his love and mercy and goodness and light known throughout the world by living his life through us. We have to submit to that and allow the Spirit to shine through us. Um, and if you're a broken vessel, like I am, and I'm guessing you are, that's okay. And I'm, and I'm proud of my Savior who chose to live in me and shine through those cracks. <coughs> and, and I don't dwell on the sin. And I've not shared with, uh, with most of you anything about the sin that I lived through, that I participated in, and I won't. Um, that's not the purpose. But you need to know I'm a sinner, saved by His grace. I was hopeless and helpless. I was lost, and without Jesus, I would die an eternal death. And so will you without Jesus. So will you. And uh, so I want to tell you, as we, as we begin to wrap up here in the next few minutes, cast off the works of darkness. Please, if, if you're hanging on, if you're a, a secret sinner, if you are a great actor and you have us all buffaloed, um, cast them off. Get rid of it. Today's the day. Do that and get dressed in this armor of light that is the Lord Jesus. And holiness and submission to Christ be your way of life. And let the Lord Jesus Christ be the uniform that you put on and, and, uh, and you wear it unashamedly. And behold, the work of God that will unfold before you. <coughs> this is a great God we serve. Amen. And I am, I am so pleased to be able to teach. And I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me the last few weeks to do that. <laughs> and I look forward to the next series. And I love you. Heavenly Father. Thank you. Help us, Lord, to cast off the works of darkness. Help us to get out of the sin business. And help us to put on the armor of light that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all. <coughs>